Rule number three, make it right. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about a time that I screwed up. Good save. So, we just released our first album, and we were off on our first big UK tour. And I really wanted to step up my stage game. So I decided I was going to learn how to spin my guitar. Has anybody ever seen anybody spin a guitar? I'm going to show you a video now. Yeah, of me. That. Right, let me clarify a few things. When I used to do it, I was a lot poorer than I am now. And the guitar I used to do it with was pretty light. The cheaper the guitar, the lighter the guitar. So when I tried to do it with a solid mahogany guitar, it didn't quite work out as well as it used to, but it's, it, this video will give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So here we go. Let's, there you go. You get there. You get the picture. You spin it. Right. So the month leading up to this tour, I went into my back garden, and I surrounded myself with pillows and mattresses, and I learned how to do this. And there is a trick. The trick is you've just got to commit and throw it really hard, and the momentum brings it back round. So I learned how to do it, and I was stoked. I was pumped. And I was like, OK, when, where am I going to do this in the, the gig? And our very last song had a part that broke down before the very last part, and it was the most super metal part of all of our songs. And I thought doing it just before that would be amazing. So I started to practice to that. And the way it worked was I'd go, spin. So, and it sounded exactly like that. Don't bother buying my album. That's exactly how it sounded. <laughs> so the first night. I'm there, Duh. spin, Duh, get, 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 get. crowd goes wild. I'm like, yes, super cool. Next night, Duh. that's a symbol, by the way. I don't know if you got that. That's it. Duh. Spin, Duh, get, get, get. great. Works all the way through the tour. Everyone's loving it. Everyone thinks we're super cool. Get to the last show, which is our headline show in our hometown. Biggest show of the entire tour. And I get to the end, I'm like, yes, they're going to love this. I'm going to go down in history. <laughs> what had happened was, I had practiced so much that the, the leather had worn away on my strap. And instead of spinning my guitar, all I did was throw it very hard, remember that part that I told it, very hard, into a wall. So I had a decision to make. What do I do? Do I run off stage crying in embarrassment, which was super tempting? Or do I fix the experience in the experience? So in a split second, I ran and dived majestically into the crowd. The crowd caught me and crowd surfed me into the mosh pit. Now, for those of you that don't know what a mosh pit is, let me explain. When your music is so beautiful and melodic, <laughs> that it causes the listener to transcend to a place of pure beauty and majesty. They want to punch each other in the face. That is a mosh pit, OK? And I ended up in the mosh pit. And everyone went super wild, even more wild than the nights that I didn't throw my guitar against the wall. As far as they were concerned, I became overcome with heavy metal passion, <laughs> threw my guitar and got in the crowd. And of course, really, we know what happened. To this day, people still tell me that that is one of their most favorite gigs of ours they ever came to. Now, I want to talk to you about fixing the experience in the experience. And I'm going to talk to you about that by talking to you about beer. I have two things I can talk about. It's music and beer. You've got beer this time. Let's say that you're in a bar, and somebody's carrying four pints. You don't really have pints in America. You have bottles, but whatever. Four pints. And you walk past them, and boom, you bump into them, and they spill the drinks. You have four ways in which you can go about remedying that situation. Number one, which is what most companies do, you go, <laughs> and you run away, and you hope they don't come after you. Nine times out of 10, they will not come after you. And you're there going, <laughs> we got away with it. Problem is, that guy is now telling everyone else in that bar what a jerk you are. Number two, he does come after you, taps you on the shoulder, says, mate, you just spilt my beers. And you go, well, actually, 
when you entered the bar, you agreed to a set of terms and conditions whereby um, the, if the occupancy was over an 80% rate, then beer spillage was a possibility, and you were carrying more than the recommended load limit of two beers, and therefore any drink replacement liability falls on your shoulders. Thank you, bye. Now he really thinks you're a jerk, and may punch you in the face. Number three. After he's threatened to punch you in the face, you go, ah, okay, okay, I'll, I'll replace the beers, so sorry, sorry, sorry. He still thinks you're a jerk, because he had to come after you to get it done. Or number four, the way in which we would most likely do it, we would immediately turn around, we would apologize, and we would replace the drinks. Don't wait for the complaint. Put it right before the customer has a chance to complain. And a big step of this is empowerment. When I dived into the crowd, I did not need to ask my manager to go and ask the record label if I had permission to jump into the crowd. I just did it because I was empowered to fix the experience in the experience.